more time. Um, the semester is moving right along. I did want to um, address the issue, speaking of the semester moving along, of your final papers. Uh, Jenny had just asked me about a topic, and as I've said, I'd like all of you to run your topics by me. Just send me an email on the VISTA site, because I think maybe I can uh, be of help depending upon the topic that you decide to treat. Um, the question was asked as well as to whether you can write on the same topic as your web paper. Yes, you can, as long as you don't plagiarize yourself. In other words, that would be something like a different medium and a different uh, way of going about an analytical paper is one thing and a website is another. But of course, yes, you can use some of the research you've done, if you like, on, on to bolster your paper on a similar or related or even the same topic. What was yours again, Julie? I've forgotten now. Amaranth and the colonization, the role it played in the right. colonization. Yeah. Of the well, you world. have to make sure to check your topic with me because that would be one that would be hard to relate to the literature we've been reading. So that was the other point I wanted to make is that this is a course that looks at history and fiction in a single glance, as it were. And I do think that your paper should take into account the theme of the course, which is thinking about how history is narrated in fiction, and especially Latin American history. So I would expect you to refer to some of the works, at least one of the works that we've read in class, and bring in historical thinking one way or another. So, for example, Jenny, and I think, Ron, you're still going to do the Of Love and Other Demons, and um, actually Lisa is doing something on Of Love and Other Demons, so you guys can talk to each other, that's fine, share ideas. Um, there, for instance, one would want to talk about the way that Garcia Marquez handles the 18th century Cartagena that's real, that is, that's real. The historical context and its fictional handlings, let's say. It seems to me you almost have to do that with that novel. I like the general in his labyrinth. How can you talk about that without talking about uh, Simon Bolivar, the real <laughs> historical figure? So I think most of the fiction that we've talked about, not all of it, but most of it that we have and will talk about demands a kind of thinking that is historical because the authors are giving us a historical setting as this one the storyteller does that we're uh, discussing today. So do, are there other questions about the final paper? I will put up on the website if it's not there already a, re a sheet that tells you how I conceive a final paper. There are also several great final papers from f previous classes that I've posted on the website so look at those and they'll give you a model of an A paper. Um, so I don't want there to be any mystery about what it is that I want. And apparently I do contradict myself someplace. Five to seven pages is fine with me. The reason I contradict myself, I think someplace else I said seven to ten, um, I hate saying length because then you have to strive, kill yourself to pad, you know, I mean padded papers I hate because uh, <laughs> I have enough to read already. I don't want to read the same thing several times. So you do have to think about a topic that's going to give you enough amplitude to, to do five to seven pages. But the fact is, if you can do it in five, that's fine. If you want to do it in ten, that's fine, as long as it's well done. So, um, and if any of you have doubts about your writing capacities, please go to the writing center and have your rough draft workshop with a tutor there. Uh, they are there for that purpose, and they might give you some good suggestions. And I mean, I'm willing to to read rough drafts if you really think you have horrible problems. What it is, I'll sit you down in my office and we'll go over the paper together because. Um, th you mustn't leave this university without knowing how to write an expository essay or an analytic analytical essay as this one is. And most of you are there already, your history and literature majors, so that's, that speaks for itself. But anyway, that's what I have to say about papers. Jenny, anything else I should be saying? Nope. You're going to turn them into turnitin.com. That number is on your, the ID number and the password are on the top of the syllabus. So, okay that done. Um, let me start with the frame narration uh, issue that I raised with you. Who can give me some ideas about why you think that that Gar uh, ha, Garcia Marquez, I almost said Vargas Llosa, um, gives us this older writer that's in, on a kind of sabbatical, it seems like, not quite a vacation, in um, Florence, which for some odd reason he uses the, the Italian name Firenze, 
I suppose because in Spanish he did too. I haven't checked that to be sure. But we're told that he's in Firenze and we're told that he goes into a photo shop and guess what? He sees some pictures of the Machi Guengas, which let's say um, releases all this narration that follows. Thinking back on himself as a young man, Mascarita and so forth. It, it unleashes this visual memory, let's say, uh, or this visual tweak to his memory unleashes the novel that we've read. And then at the end we come back and I think some real important things are said at the end. Uh, and So who, who wants to comment on that? Uh, who got that far? Eli, do you have any insights there? You who are a very good reader of texts, though you don't say much back there. <laughs> I've discovered you. Um, in the back somewhere yeah. he, um, he mentions about the oil industry coming in to the uh, Make sure to Peru. speak into that little mic because I want future generations to hear you. Could you pull it toward you a bit? Does it pull? Yeah. Okay, good. Sure. I'm sorry, would you start again? I beg your pardon. He mentions the oil industry coming in to uh, Peru, pushing out the Machiguengas. I thought that was interesting. The oil industry. And does he mention that at the, at the end or you're saying that that's why this retrospective narrative is important or... What does I that was, have to I do? was just commenting on that. You asked if I was, uh, I, I thought you'd ask. I was asking really about the frame narration, how you, how you evaluate that. In other words, mm -hmm. why, why do you think, I mean, I don't mean to call on you and pick on you in particular. I just wanted to know if you had any ideas. I mean, the oil industry, yeah, we're going to get to, but let's think about the frame narration for a minute. Why does he do that? Do you have any theories about that? Um, I think he wants to unravel the story of Mascarita slowly, the way he slowly discovered. So when you read it as a, as a recollection, the way he does, and uh, spliced into the story that way, he, um, you as a reader slowly unravel that mystery the way he did. Yeah. But do you think that he has to be, we have to know that the narrator is in Florence for him to tell the story in the way we, he did? Seems to me he could have done exactly what you're saying and what he does do without that frame. Why does he want us to see the narrator in the present? Well, maybe it gives some temporal perspective. Lisa, were you going to say something on this along these lines? I, I was just going to say that I think that it's, it makes it a story telling about a storytelling and it kind of puts you know boxes inside boxes and, and I think sort of being the, the trinity concept that we touched on the other day and the concept it just brings religion a little bit into the picture again. Oh I hadn't thought of that you mean because of Florence and because uh -huh. well of course Florence is a great renaissance center I wouldn't even necessarily say religious center though there's plenty of churches and so forth but yeah that's a possibility. Um, I think you're right that any frame narr narration, think of the turn of the screw. You remember how Henry James' The Turn of the Screw begins with these jolly Englishmen sitting around a roaring fire. You know, it's a mystery. It's a ghost story, The Turn of the Screw. And these very solid Englishmen are sitting around a roaring fire having their sherry or their beer or whatever, just being very convivial. And one of them says to the other, you know, I, I just, I heard this story lately that kind of um, worries me. Let me tell it to you. Or it kind of, it's interesting. And then he tells the story. And it's often said, well, Henry James wanted to give more credibility to the guy telling a ghost story. So he gives, him, gives us this picture of him, this kind of solid, upstanding citizen. And then it makes the reader think, well, this is going to be, this isn't some nut telling this story. It, so it's to give credibility to the story that follows. Well, the, here I think there's something different going on. And I think that what we have is absolutely what you've said, especially their first point, is that it raises the historical narration. It raises the history of it. If you, it's like at the end of A Hundred Years of Solitude where we learn that the narrator is Melchiades but, and that he's been working on this story forever and he's been telling it but we haven't known it all along and I say well why do we find this out three, three pages before the end of the story? And part of it is to raise the theme of how you tell the story. So I think there is that. We see this kind of process of memory. It heightens the issues of memory. It heightens the fact that this is one fellow's story, not, not an omniscient narrator. We know who the narrator is. And we see that he's very moved by all this. Um, at the end, the, let's just go to the end and look at it. Part of the reason he puts, him, he puts himself, if you want, because it's hard not to 
think of this narrator as Vargas Llosa, though we mustn't do that. It's a constructed character, but one perhaps that is similar to the, the author himself. If you look at this last business, these, it starts on page, um, let's see, it's not marked, but I'll give it to you. It's uh, 235, page 235. We, we are back now to the, what would, we'd have to call narrative present. We've been in this retrospective narrative, you know, let me tell you about what happened 25 years ago, that, and that's what we've seen with Mascarita. And then we come back to the narrative present. Okay, so then we see him trying to figure out his own past, trying to figure out the, the history of Peru, the, the indigenous question that we talked about last time. So yes, it raises and makes even thematic the issue of how you tell the story. Yeah, Amanda. Um, there's also, and I was looking for it, there's a quote in here where he talks about how the, the, the people of Florence really hate all these invading tourists. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of a, yeah. a remark on the... Uh, the, uh, the Machu Chang, Chang Yes, class. yeah. I think that's the other th the other thing that I would say. Well, there's several important things here because we get a recap of what the narrator thinks about Mascarita. We can about the the Machiguenga. We can we can look at that. But it's really the very last paragraph where, the, yeah. If you've ever been in Florence in the summer, you can't walk down the sidewalk. It's so crowded, and it's not all people. Uh, it's not all tourists. But basically, Florence is a very small town, but incredibly important. You can stand in line for two or three hours to see Michelangelo's David, the, the fabulous statue. I didn't have to stand in line quite that long, but I said, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do this, and I hate standing in line, and blah, blah, blah. But I did it, and I was very glad. So if you <laughs> ever have that debate, it, it, seeing it in real life, is, uh, you've seen a thousand pictures of it, it's still, uh, it's different, you know, it's, it's there. Um, but what we get then is a picture of the modern world, don't we? This globalized planet that we live on. Look at the very last paragraph, and he celebrates it. This contact of cultures as a, let's say, recent phenomenon. We can talk about, you know, 1492 and the conflicts of cultures that happened after that, the ultimate convergings of cultures, but don't think we're done yet. So this whole theme we've been following of syncretism and of transculturation is going on in the Florence of the today of the narrative present. The, just look at that uh, it's a kind of lyrical ending in a way, 245, the second to last page, the last paragraph, darkness has fallen and there are stars in the Florentine night, Florentine night, I guess. Go down to the middle of that paragraph. I could mingle with the young people, do you find it? High on music and marijuana in the Piazza del Santo Espiritu, Spirito, <laughs> or the Piazza del Signoria, because at this very hour, a motley cour de miracle, where four or five, even ten different impromptu show shows are simultaneously staged. Look at that word motley. Anybody have the etymology of that? Motley? How do you use that? We often say a motley crew, meaning really mixed. Motley it means stained or. Um, Variegated, that's the word, variegated, motley. If you look it up in the dictionary, and it used to be that clowns in the Renaissance wore motley. You say, what's that, wore motley? Well, like camouflage suits of the current army of the U.S., that, that kind of splotty, splotchy. So that motley crew here, Caribbean, Morocco players and acrobats, Turkish rope walkers, Moroccan fire eaters, Spanish students, serenaders, French mimes, American jazz musicians, gypsy fortune tellers, German guitarists, Hungarian flutists. Sometimes it's enjoyable to lose oneself in this colorful, useful multitude. But tonight I know that wherever I might wander, blah, 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 keep going, skip that. He's talking about the different places he might wander in Florence. Wherever I might try to find refuge from the heat, the mosquitoes, the rapture of my spirit, I, can, I would still hear close but unceasing crackling the immemorial of the Machiguenga storyteller. So it's a kind of homage at the end to this story he's told. We know all along that he, he's fascinated by the Sao, but he hasn't evaluated it for us until now. 
he actually is even more more um, specific about his amazement at this cultural achievement of Saul, which I want you to question somewhat. I, I kind of do myself, but 244, he summarizes for us his evaluation of this, let's say, total cultural conversion of Saul. His seems like utter change of identity. Talking the way a storyteller talks means being able to feel and live in the very heart of that culture, means having penetrated its essence, reached the marrow of its history and mythology, given body to its taboos, images, ancestral desires, and terrors. It means being in the most profound way possible, a rooted Machi Gwenga, one of that ancient lineage who, in the period in, in which this Firenze, where I am writing, produced its dazzling effervescence of ideas, paintings, buildings, crimes, and intrigues. That's the Quattrocento, 1400s, when Michelangelo was working there, when uh, Leonardo and others were, were there, this height of Florence, he says, at the same period, these people, this ancient lineage, roamed the forests of my country, bringing and bearing away those tales, lies, fictions, gossip, and jokes that make a community of that people of scattered beings, keeping alive among them the feeling of oneness, of constituting something fraternal and solid. That my friend Saul gave up being all he was and might have become so as to roam through the Amazonian jungle for more than 20 years now, perpetuating against tide, wind and tide, and above all against the very concepts of modernity and progress. That's important, that little above all. The tradition of that invisible line of wandering storytellers is something that memory now and again brings back to me, and so forth. So he's admiring Saul's move into this other culture, and indeed he, admire, he, admi he is admiring cultures that can maintain their separation from modernity, that is from refrigerators and can openers and that kind of thing. Um, so we can question that admiration, we can wonder whether Saul isn't actually invading a culture in ways that he shouldn't be. We talked about this last time, he certainly goes against his own ideology, which is you leave indigenous cultures to themselves. But um, anyway, are there comments about this frame tale? Yeah. Um, I think it creates a really interesting contrast mm -hmm. that kind of parallels the uh, inversion of Saul's um, purist standpoint and then his um, integration into, the, into a culture that is not his. Um, and you think the frame tale does that because the narrator is in Florence, mm -hmm, um, which is well, well the rena it could be. I, I've always learned uh, or been taught that um, the Renaissance is kind of the beginning of modernity. Mm -hmm. um, so you have the um, a place which is revered and visited by people all over the world um, as this birth or rebirth of. Um, classical culture, mm -hmm. which is kind of ironic because it's, it's a rebirth of something from the past, um, whereas the, the Machuenge culture is, um, they don't have the same, um, well, Western uh, perspectives of present, past, and future, and... Um, right, so you're just saying that Florence is contrasting a lot with the Amazonian jungle, and that's certainly true. Um, obviously, yeah, one is high Western, the other is not Western at all. So there is something to that. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. The, uh, the narrator himself is very far away from the story he's telling. Um, and what that contrast does for us, I'm not exactly sure, does it makes the Machi Gwengas the more exotic? We wouldn't want to go there exactly, just sort of to point out the difficulties of narrating the story or I wonder where we would go with that. Yeah, Lisa? I just feel like it, it just makes you more uh, conscious maybe of how mm -hmm. far Saul's journey was. I, I mean, I well, think just, just too, there's yeah. sort of this, uh, you know, mundane normal world, it's not quite as, 
you, you know, they don't go that far into how badly the oil companies are doing this or that. You know, they, they think that he's he's on sabbatical, so he's just sort of there. Yeah. But it shows you, it plants Saul as a guy who could have had that same life. Yeah. And, and so sort of his long journey through religious issues with his dad and, and then beyond and back, I think it just makes the journey yeah, yeah, that's more descriptive. Yeah. yeah, because of the difference again, the contrast that Julie was pointing out, the contrast between the Machiguenga and Flor, uh, the Amazon and Florence, and then between Saul and the narrator. Uh, the, yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are good points. Should you do you want to talk about the Jewish question that you're talking that you're looking at now, Lisa? That kind of. Uh, it might fit in here a bit. Lisa was asking questions about the difference between Portuguese. This is a bit of a digression here. We're going to come back to the novel, but I think we've maybe said enough about the frame tale, so the frame uh, structure. So, so Lisa, just a couple words about this is what Lisa's going to write her paper on, and it's about Jewish and Portuguese, et cetera. You tell what it's about. It's very interesting research. Well, uh, the, the Portuguese question came up because of um, Abre Nuncio in, in uh, of Love and Other Demons. And I just went back and looked at it because I did know that, or Dr. Zamora asked me to look at it. We never talked about it in class, but she had asked me to look at what was different about the expulsion of the Jews from Portugal versus Spain. And it was very different. And, um, and that's sort of put me on a course of being very interested in all the ways the Jews are treated in the books we're reading, which they keep popping up. Um, but Abrenuncio, being Portuguese, it turns out that um, at the 1500s there was a large exodus of, of Jews um, into the New World. They thought that they were safe. They thought that they were... Um, from Portugal. They thought that they were safe from the Inquisition right. because th they thought percentage-wise the number of non-Catholics in the New World meant that they would be able to sort of find a, a place where they could establish themselves. Um, the difference in the way they were kicked out just to... Now we're talking about Portugal. There's an exodus from Portugal of Jews to the Portuguese New World. Right. Right, yes. As opposed to Spain, which didn't want Jews or even people with Jewish blood at all going to the New World until after four generations had passed. So the, the Portuguese um, policy was much more lenient, let's say. Or the Portuguese was less lenient? Well, what happened when, when the Jews were kicked out of Spain in 1492, um, many of them went to Portugal and they spent one or two generations there before they were kicked out of Portugal. Um, but when they were kicked out of Spain, they were asked to leave their belongings behind and, and sent on the road. But when they were kicked out of Portugal, um, it was really kind of a trick. Like on the first day of Passover, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since I first started looking at that, so the details I might have the days wrong. But the first or second day of Passover, Passover, they were asked to go to Lisbon. Well, Lisbon had been designated as the only port that Jews could exit from because the king, uh, Manuel II, I think was his name, um, was very aware, much more so maybe than Isabella and Ferdinand, that the Jews represented a, a tremendous knowledge base, administrative skills, and all those things we talked about before. So um, he didn't really want to get them kicked out, but he needed to secure his um, his. Uh, claim to the throne. So he was negotiating to marry a Spanish infanta, one of the Isabels, and he um, had, like on the day that he signed his marriage contract, five days later, he had to, part of the contract stipulated he had to kick the Jews out of, uh, out of Portugal. So when they arrived in Lisbon, they didn't know why they were coming. And when they arrived in Lisbon, they were told that they needed to um, either convert, and they were basically forced right there on the spot to convert. Either they must convert, or uh, their children would be taken from them as they left, or and, and they would be settled into, uh, they were supposed to bring their children ages 5 through 14 or something like this. So the idea was is their children were going to be confiscated and put into Catholic uh, homes and raised as Catholics, as good Catholics, and so on. Of course, this you know was completely unacceptable to the Jews. So they, it, the stories go that some smothered their children, killed them, children, and killed themselves. All kinds of horrible things happened, and uh, and so that's sort of the summary of how that went. Um, but 
but what I read indicated that the 1500s was a period of a lot of Jews leaving, regardless of this go with or without your children and whatever, they were still being kicked out. They had to convert or leave. Um, if somebody's interested in it for a paper topic, there's also an interesting group of Jews that until this, like in the last 50 years, were living secretly kind of on the border of Portugal and Spain and didn't, uh, didn't know there were other Jews in the world. And when mm -hmm. a, a Jewish guy comes in, there, it's kind of a known group, I can't tell you the name at this moment, but there are a lot of interesting things about Jews in hiding and, and this sort of thing. Okay, well, so, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, it kind of goes on and on. want to extend this to Mascarita because that was... Right. He's, he's, I think that he's doing his aliyah, his return to the homeland, by, by becoming this ah. storyteller. And, and it actually mentions aliyah later on in the book, mm -hmm. so that's it does right. talk yeah. about it. But, um, yeah. but I think that's exactly what he's doing. He's identified himself with a, a minority people, and he's, I think he's doing what he needs to do as a good Jew. Yeah, kind yeah of that, going back. that reference is um, on page 243 in the frame tale, actually, the, the idea of the Jew finding himself finally um, at home, if you want. Uh, it's about five lines up from the bottom of the page, 243, in a very subtle and personal way, by going to the Alto Uruamba to be born again, Saul made his aliyah, if that's how you, you, say, you pronounce it, um, aliyah. So, I think you know, it's, it's one more function of the, thank you, that, that really worked wonderfully to talk also about the frame narration. It allows the narrator to give his opinion of the story he's just told, to, to assess, as I asked you to do, the, um, the voyage or the journey, if you want, of, of Saul. It also, obviously, in this novel, functions to make him even more of an outsider than at the out, at the outset, more of an outsider than he would have been otherwise. His birthmark, his Jewish heritage, and so forth, in a very Catholic uh, situation, so more likely, more credible that he should wish to do this almost impossible thing of becoming a Machiguenga. Um, somehow, that background suggests his. Dis well, it makes it more more likely that he might do this than, say, a Varghitas, who's a mainstream guy who uh, doesn't have any real pop need to leave his own culture uh, in particular. Yeah, Julie? Um, could you repeat what the definition of uh, Aliyah is? It was just brought up. Why don't you do that for us? It's a, it's, you, it's a, it, I think the, the, he, it comes from a Hebrew word that means like a going up. And it's in a concept that's returning to the homeland. It came after World War II, which was right. I think that the the date that Saul's father died was actually kind of consistent with the start founding of Israel. I'm not sure. I tried to find that before oh, class. Yeah. Um, so I think the day, the year anyway that his dad died was the same year that Israel was was founded or whatever. But this concept of Aliyah is um, not only Jewish but an idea that a people have a homeland and it's, it's built into, I think, the, um, the legal system in Israel that people who are uh, Jewish anywhere in the world, of course, Holocaust survivors who had no place to go, um, have this right to, to return to, that Israel is their homeland, although they may not have another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, all of that wandering elicits the desire to cease wandering, which is why the U.S. has the policy it does with respect to the state of Israel today. Um, we very, very much support Israel, and there's a lot of doubt about whether we should be doing that given problems in the Middle East, so it's a huge contemporary question. Do, I'm glad you mentioned dates. Do notice that this novel ends, the frame tale ends, with dates that, again, like the, the, the note that Garcia Marquez puts before um, Of Love and Other Demons, dated 1994. This dated 1985, he, from Florence, July, to London, 1987. It strikes me, I mean, I'm likely to believe that those were the dates that the novel was written. I happen to know that Vargas Llosa does live part of the year in London. The book is published in 1989. So perfectly possible that these are factual dates. And what we know is that the flashback goes back to the late 40s and then through the 50s. He'll give us dates every once in a while, 1958, 1954. He wants us to see 
where this history fits. And he does also want us to see the beginning of the end of the Amazon, I think, the, exploit, the oil exploitation and the entry of commercial interests in big ways, though there was always the rubber, there was also before the rubber boom until World War I, I think, or was it World War II when synthetic rubber uh, became, uh, was invented and no longer was it, were people traipsing around um, exploiting rubber. We've heard about the timber exploitation before that. so. This isn't, uh, the oil exploration isn't the first uh, commercial venture to damage the, uh, the region. So, okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I, we do have to keep thinking, yes, about the policies of the colonial powers that settled Latin America. We're practic Brazil in this course, which of course is, is, um, was a Portuguese territory, is almost invisible in this course, and I'm sorry about that. We could have read a, a Brazilian novel or at least thought more about Brazil. I pointed out the places where Portugal and Spain are compared in the buried mirror because this policies of Portugal were somewhat different from those of Spain and uh, in terms of, of the Jewish question as well. Lisa, the reason I apparently wrongly said that I, from what you were saying that the Jewish the policy toward Jews in Portugal was more lenient is because they were allowed to go to the New World. That really is a huge difference. Spain did not want Jews or recent converts, new Christians as they were called, to go, go to the New World. So, um, so at one point Lisa made the very interesting thing that when you said in the colonial context in New Spain, if you sp said un portugués, someone from Portugal, it was almost the same as saying a Jew because there were so many Portuguese Jews, something that I hadn't realized. So uh, one keeps on learning. Thank you, that, very interesting research. And where else have you seen Jews in our reading? Abre Nuncio, Mascarita, the question comes up big Fuentes. time in, in Fuentes. And then there are just various references within Galeano to... to With Galeano, yeah. Jewish, yeah. Jewish, yeah. Jewish, yeah. Jewish doctor. Uh, an Argentinian yeah. farmer type person. Yeah. It seemed to be an unusual story because yeah. it didn't seem to have a lot of purpose other than to say a Jewish family yeah. had lived in this in this way. Yeah, right. And, and today, obviously, in Latin America, there are strong, flourishing Jewish communities in Mexico, in Argentina, and so forth. So it's not to say that uh, Jews are, um, that the same situation exists now as it did during the colonial period, far from it, so. Okay. Scott, if we could see my little blackboard here. This <laughs> is very hard to read. I'm sorry, I'm not very good at writing. I guess I sh on this blackboard I should write bigger. But if you wanted, this is my little index. You'll have your own of the worldview of the Machiguenga. And you can either copy this or I can even put it up on our website if you like. But as I was reading this novel and as I read it, I make notes to try to understand the culture. We looked at some of the passages that have to do with number one, animism. And this issue that is animism, meaning that the world is animate, the earth is animate. It has, it's like people are animate in the Western view, and dogs well, and cats, and certain privileged animals, though we eat unprivileged ones. So, but trees and the stars and the sun we don't consider have spirit or life or soul or mind. Animate cultures that are animistic believe that the world trees, flowers, I don't know, um, natural phenomena have power, they have minds of their own, the stars, Venus was a huge concern for the Aztecs, what was Venus doing? Uh, very dangerous positions and so forth, uh, which is why some of the ancient cultures, especially in Latin America, but elsewhere were great astronomers, they had to figure out what the stars had in mind, what their disposition it was. So we talked about that. I've written down some pages where we see Machi Gwenga attitudes toward life and death, pages 38, 43, 52. Those, those, it's random, it's not a complete index. The body-soul question, the body and soul are not separate. We have in Western culture a kind of dualist thinking where we think of mind as one thing, body as another, mind-body problem. We think of the body and the soul, the soul exists 
uh, outside of the body after death, if you're if you have a certain set of beliefs, that kind of thing. We can look at all of these pages, but since we're running out of time, I wanted just to point them out. The self. We looked at some of these pages. The way that the self is relational and functional. That identity is not stable. That the self can go in. The, Actually, number eight is re related to that metamorphosis, the fluidity of forms. Remember, we see that a self can become uh, another animal. It can become or have claws and so forth. We read a passage along that. So selves morph into other selves and so forth. Um, that, that fluid subjectivity that we've talked about. And then I want to look maybe, if we will have enough time to look at Time, the concept of time. We said loosely and correctly that there isn't a concept of past, present, and future, a concept of a progressive history. That thing that is so basic to modernity. The idea that tomorrow we can make the world a better place if we just develop it. Never mind that development turns out not always to be such a great thing. Uh, so here there's a kind of perennial now. Let's, we'll look at a few of those pages. The issue of quantity, remember they have numbers only up to three, and we're told why. We'll look at that. We mentioned last time that they're absolutely against change. That is part of not being modern in the Western sense, because if you don't have a sense of today and tomorrow, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, a sense of progress, then more likely you're, you're not wanting to change, make things better. Every year we get bigger and better, and we change, and change is a good thing, and so forth, which is, that's what, why we so believe in education in this culture, why everybody needs an education, because education will change you. In fact, one of U of H's mottos is changing minds. And I sort of like that. I, I think if you get, I, I am totally American in that belief system. I think if you get an education, you probably should be different when you walk out of the door with your diploma than you were when you walked in. Otherwise, why bother? You see, I, I have this very American notion that change is good in that sense that you, you learn things you didn't know, you maybe question your beliefs. Absolutely un machiguinga. No, no need for change. When you change, you upset the order of the cosmos. The order is there already before you ever set foot. And the idea that you're going to make it better, no. If you change it, by definition, it's worse. Saul didn't take his degree. Ah, Saul didn't take his degree. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have it. Yeah. Hmm. And yet, he certainly made a huge personal change in his own life, so that we'll have to weigh that one for a minute. But yeah, the, interesting. And then the very last point, nine, is the importance of the oral tradition, the storytelling tradition. That separates the Machiguenga tremendously from our own print-oriented culture. And just because we now are totally glued to the internet for everything doesn't mean that we're not still print-oriented. Granted, there are lots of visual images that aren't language, that aren't print, but we still, on the internet, depend upon language tremendously that isn't heard, that isn't spoken. So we have music, of course, but this importance of orality and the storytelling, we already said it. It's part of the idea of transmitting the past to the future. It's what keeps a traditional society, society traditional. And it's a bit what we've, we've lost in our own culture. So this constant reminder that the storyteller is only a medium through which the stories pass, that's why I think the perhaps is there. That's why that's what they tell me anyway. That phrase gets repeated again and again. The storyteller keeps things from changing even as he moves from place to place. But uh, obviously the or orality, as we just read in the final uh, pages of the, of the novel, also has to do with the cultural glue that I, I keeps these, this dispersed culture up on what the other, other branches and wings are doing. How, do, how was it put, keeps them uh, unified, I, I believe. Let's see, hang on. Now I wish, there's just a nice phrase, it's on page 244, but 
I can't, oh yeah, there, we, there it is. Keeping alive among them the feeling of oneness. It's about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines up from the bottom of 244. Keeping alive among them the feeling of oneness, of constituting something fraternal and solid. So this, what, what does that in our own culture? Well, not storytelling anymore. It might have in rural communities and so forth, but um, obviously we all have a tradition of which we're a part, but we, it's education, it's shared values, shared views that we get through print, largely. Like I like to say, you know, you can't get out of freshman English, you can't get out of your freshman year at University of Houston without, in, or any place out of high school without being able to read and write. Um, you can get out of umpteen years of graduate school without drawing a straight line, without being able to draw, without being able to judge spatial. Let's say, think of a lot of things you can perfect, auto shop. You don't have to learn to uh, repair anything mechanical. Goodness, if we, I had, I think I would never have gotten out of eighth grade. <laughs> but um, I couldn't have gotten out of eighth grade without reading and writing. So there's a moment where in our culture decided that it's print that matters. And that to be able to read and write uh, is, is more important than anything. So an oral tradition isn't part of what modernity values in particular, though we love a great stand-up comedy and we like to you know, watch movies where people speak their lines very well, uh, it's not, not the same thing as this kind of storyteller. Yeah. Um, plus, I, the move um, in modernity to um, mass mediums of communication yeah. is totally different from the very personal yeah, sure. um, storytelling mm -hmm. where you're sit sitting in a circle kind of like you know you listen to your grandmother's stories right. and they mean something for you when you go see you know a Hollywood film it's right I, it's I don't much find cultural significance yeah in right it. yeah sure no a, a mass the, yeah a huge difference between our contemporary mass media and and the individual nature of the storyteller's circumstances so yeah thank you that's that's another good point Okay, let's look at a couple of these issues then that were on my blackboard. Um, 31, let's look at the time issue just for the moment. Go to page 93, will you? We can just knock off some of these world view issues if you want um, it, fairly quickly because there's very clearly stated in the Western chapters what these groups believed. At the top of 93, Varguitas, our first person narrator, tells us about what the Machi Guengos think. He tells us, she tells, he tells us through Mrs. Schneel, whom I doubt existed, though somebody maybe like her did, the Summer Institute for Linguistics, but he may have, have gotten this information, the author, from the two books that are in our library that were written in the 1940s by priests studying the Machiguenga. And we can look at those two in a minute, the, the, the references. Top of the page, the first full paragraph, Mrs. Schneel interrupted to explain to me that it was difficult to be sure of that. The Machiguenga verb system was complicated and misleading, among other reasons because it readily mixed up past and present. Now, that, a traditional culture would do that. The, the present isn't that different from the past. Just as the word for many, tobaiti, was used to express a quantity above four, now, also included at least today and yesterday, and the present tense of verbs was frequently used to count events in the recent past. It was as though to them only the future was something clearly defined. Our conversation turned to linguistics and, end, and ended with a string of examples of the humorous and unsettling implications of a form of speech in which before and now were barely differ differentiated. I was deeply moved by the thought of that being, those beings in that unhealthy, in the unhealthy forests of eastern Cusco and Madre de Dios, making long journeys of days or weeks, bringing stories from one group of Machiguengas to another and taking away others. And this issue of community, let's keep, this is a different issue, but let's just keep going here because it's important. 
a group of one from bringing the stories from one group of Machiguenga to another and taking away others, reminding each each member of the tribe that the others were alive, that despite the great distances that separated them, they still formed a community, shared a tradition and beliefs, ancestors' misfortunes and joys. The fleeting, perhaps legendary figures of those habladores who by occupation out of necessity to satisfy a human whim, using the simplest, most time hallowed of expedients, the telling of stories, were the living sap that circulated and made the Machiguengas into a society, a people of interconnected and interdependent beings. We just saw that kind of um, praise for this social glue, as I call it, the storytellers. Uh, we just saw that in the, the final pages. Okay, there, so, so back to the, the business that before and now are virtually indistinguishable. Now let's go to page 116 where we're going to get a little more insight. We can say, well, wh what, what does that mean? I said, for one thing, it's a traditional society that now and before are virtually the same because there hasn't been change. But then you say, but then the future, he, then he says to us, or tells us that the future seems the only thing that's clear to them or clearly separated. Well, that may still be a, a traditional society, but we wonder why the future is defined fairly clearly. Let's see if we can figure it out. Page 116. We see an example of, in the Machiguenga storytellers, lexicon of this vagueness about time and about the passage of time. It's, it's simple here. It's below the middle of the, well, figure the middle paragraph. Let's just start there. Furious at what they'd done to Kashiri, the moon. His father, the sun, stayed put, burning us. He dried up the rivers, parched the fields. This is animism, right? That the, the sun is animate, has power over humans and is doing here this here to, re, to avenge himself. Made the animals die of thirst. He's never going to move again, said the Majigwenga, tearing their hair. They were so frightened. They were frightened. We're doomed to die, they sang sadly. So then the Seri Pigari went up to Inki, Inkite. He spoke to the sun. The Seri Pigari is the wise man, remember the sorcerer, the medicine man, the uh, priest. He spoke to the sun. He persuaded him, it seems. He would move again. We'll walk together, he, they say, he said. Notice that embedded narrative. I get this from a lot of tellers, he's saying. They say, he said. That's the way life was from then on, the way it is now. That's where before ended and after began. That's why we go on walking. That phrase, that's where before ended and after began. And we speak of the before and after pictures, you know, of, 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 of change. And here he is talking about a change that happened. The sun decided not to continue punishing them. And so, but, but that phrase, that's where before ended and after began, suggests that it, it's not that it's, it was 1492. <laughs> it's a very different uh, view of, of counting. One more passage on time, just to continue here. Look at 191. Let's see what we can. I mean, all of this, it's a bit like our trying to figure out exactly what, who Tasurinci is last time. Finally, it's better not to because there aren't the categories that are so defined. So time seems to blur. Identity is fluid. The gods become fathers of communities, become whatever. But it's clear that there's some sort of importance attached, whether familial or cosmic, to someone called Tasurinci and so forth. So we have to kind of leave some of these categories, I think, a bit uh, more fluid than we'd like. I'm just pointing to the phrase at the middle of 191. What happened to him? This happened to him. That was before. And then he starts the, uh, so I, I just, that business of that was before, again, that kind of vagueness about, uh, about temporal relations, which is so different in a way from, well, so different in many ways from our own sense of, of the passage of time. Let's look also at quantity, the issue of quantity. Again, this unwillingness to count beyond three, 
That's so interesting. You'd think they'd count up to 12 or so. Um, we're so used to thinking in terms of discrete things, whether pieces of money, how much we make, whether years, whether, whether um, distances. We're very specific as a culture, uh, and I should say that includes the Western world, as it were, Europe and the parts of the world colonized by Europe, and probably to some extent China and Japan who weren't colonized by Europe as well. Um, let's see, 83. It's just an example. Again, we can do what we want with it. We've seen this page before because it tells us about the god Tasurinchi, Tasu creator of everything that existed, and so forth. But I want to go down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. Here are the reference to quantity. Their, their language had expressions only for the quantities one, two, three, and four. All the others were covered by the adjective many. Their notion of paradise was modest, a place where the rivers had fish and the woods had game. They associated their nomad life with the movement of the stars through the firmament. But it, there's only that one, well, two sentences. Their language had expressions only for the quantities one, two, three, and four. All the others were covered by the adjective many. Okay, now what do we say about a worldview like that? That they're in tune with nature, that they're not acquisitive, that they're not merchants or traders, or they would certainly, that they're not astronomers. I mean, the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Incas had hugely complicated ways of, of a calendrical cal calculation. So especially the Aztecs and Mayas, they certainly had numbers in a much more uh, elaborate way than the Machiguenga. So we have to say the Machiguengas weren't great astronomers. They watched the stars. They think of their walking as stars moving through the firmament, but they're not uh, calculators. They're not mathematicians in any way. Well, I'll let you speculate further on this. I think if you feel you're in charge of this novel, we can go on to Elena Garro on Tuesday. If not, and we feel like we still are floundering because of the difficulty of the novel, we can go, we can go back. Are you ready to go on to Elena Garro, or shall we continue with this a bit more? Or are you tired of this? Okay, we'll go on to Garro. See you on Tuesday.